In the run-up to me coming today, the university dug out a piece of film of me talking to somebody about um, the rights of the disabled child. And my only thought was, I'm not sure how long ago that was, but I've aged a lot. <laughs> oh, dear me. Anyway, you will get the text of this lecture, but as always, I thought it was finished, and then I sat with it and a pen. So it clearly wasn't, which um, is redolent of my issues with the grammar test in the Key Stage 2 SATs. Because <laughs> if you show me a sentence and ask me to find out whether this is a non-finite subordinate clause, I will tell you that if you'd asked me to write something, then we could have talked about whether it was a non-finite subordinate clause, rather than asking me to find it as if I was doing an exercise in the grammar book from 1958. The, the Key Stage 2 SATs English uh, papers include a grammar test that says find the subjunctive in this sentence to which my response as a lifelong reader and writer is why <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget as an English inspector I will get into this in a minute uh, as an English inspector running a reading survey in the authority I then worked in and we went in on the basis of paired reading and uh, reading trackers and sitting alongside a reader and talking to them and I went into one of our wonderful primary schools that actually taught reading on a mixed basis. So it did teach phonics and it did teach whole word and it did teach look and say and it had a fantastic library and collections of books all over the place and children were immersed. But it stuck to a central core reading scheme, which was, for those of you who remember it, Roger Red Hat <laughs> and Billy Blue Hat. Are oh, there still schools that have got that? And we... we did a reading interview that had standard questions in it because we wanted to compare across schools and across age groups and across cohorts so that we were using the same reading interview and part of that reading interview was you would get to an appropriate point in the book that the child had chosen to bring to you to read and you would say what do you think happens next before you turn the page and this very cute and astute six-year-old said why the bloody hell am I bothered <laughs> Because we were reading Roger Red Hat and Billy Blue Hat and all the rest of it, and why is that interesting? Anyway, he said, maybe I should have picked something else. <laughs> so I let him pick something else, and we had a really good conversation after that. But the issue for me has always been that if the more we try to cabin and standardise childhood, the more it escapes around the edges. And that's the beauty of working with children and young people that actually it's in the points at which it escapes around the edges that you can actually begin both to interact and if they've got issues in their lives to solve them and to help them. I've been asked to, th to speak to a question, does every child still matter? And there is an assumption in that question that I do think we have to go on challenging. That children truly matter consistently, universally, to all of us as adults, who are the holders of the power in relationships, conversations, and therefore in the debate across British society. It's a moot point that I want to explore this evening. What do I do now? Um, since last July, I have been, and I am really proud to be, a director for uh, a consultancy company called Empower. That's I, not E, but it, otherwise it's spelled like Empower. And we have a website with lots and lots of free materials on it. We're the biggest organisation in the country that works entirely and wholly and solely with the public sector or with bodies that are commissioned and paid for with public money and doing the work that used to be done by public sector organisations. Um, our work is about helping them to improve when they sometimes can't see the wood for the trees. And I'll say a bit more about that towards the end. But I've had a career since 1979, which until I started this job last July, was entirely in the public service and I'm now in the commercial sector so you won't be surprised to hear me tell you that it's taken me six months to get used to the notion and it will take me still longer to be good at it. So for those of you who are just embarking on your career, if you think you're going to be stellar the day you walk through the classroom door on day one, I'm here to tell you that's not going to be it. <laughs> It'll take you half a year and for that half year you'll be constantly exhausted. Live through it because it gets better. As has just been said, a comprehensive school alumna who was then Cambridge educated, when I entered teaching, I headed straight back for comprehensive schools. I'm going to state my entirely personal but absolutely lifelong belief 
based on my having been given a choice in the West Riding schools in which I was educated as to whether or not to sit the 11 plus. And I chose not to, as did my twin brother. So we went to the comprehensive school that was slightly closer. And I was surprised last year to hear uh, Sir Michael Wilshaw, but I agreed with him when he made an evidence-based Her Majesty's Chief Inspector state statement last year that taken universally, grammar schools do not help the lowly child to achieve or aspire. What he was talking about was the universal evidence across the system. I could respond to your it worked for me and tell you that my comp worked for me. We could have a tit for tat discussion. What I'm saying is that this is my view and it's a personal view. Selection places 11 year olds, the summer born are 10, into examination rooms. On the basis of the tests they take in those rooms, they are ranked against each other as a cohort and a line is drawn between the top however many percent and the rest. On a marking boundary, which if you're one side, you pass, and if you're the other side, you fail. Just like the top of all the tops passes and the bottom of all the bottoms fails. That top percentage goes on to grammar schools, which if we believe in those spot tests, will take the best. And that's a really wide group, actually, into a different setting from the majority who then attend schools which if they truly had all the ability range would be comprehensives and in some parts of the country that's what they're called. It can't be comprehensive if you've got 80%, 75% of the ability cohort, not most of it. The 11 year old who peaks on landing in a grammar school on day one may never reattain that peak. Children who fail the 11 plus by a mark may, and I am married to one, go on to become stellar achievers. The system is defended for reasons that do not hold water. That bright students are held back and middle ability children and strugglers have their potential destroyed if we go on educating them together after they're 11. The arguments are backed by claims that in every comprehensive school in the land, children are all, always taught in mixed ability classes. That's not true. But hey, let's not stop the flow of the argument. The matching assumption is that in all those comprehensive schools, classes are lawless, uncontrolled spaces where nobody ever works and nobody ever achieves, least of all the brightest and the best. That GCSE, A-level and other results prove otherwise. That entry to university by children from these schools, of course, alongside those from public schools and grammar schools, has risen and risen over decades. That graduates from them are everywhere, it's very clear that if in doubt, you clearly should never let the evidence get in the way of a good story. Or in this case, a nation's ill-defended prejudices. That's only an illustration, and I stress that it's a personal view, and I promise the rest won't be anywhere near so controversial of what I want to go on to talk about. We all as a society say that our children matter. We claim that we want to close the many gaps. Every piece of political rhetoric by every government of every colour of every flag for the last decade after decade after decade has been, we want to close the gaps. We talk a really good talk as a nation, but walking the walk is too often more of a challenge. And ladies and gentlemen, we do not want to pay Norway's 55% tax on a 50,000 pound salary that would make it happen. I've been asked to reflect in this lecture after a lifetime of working with and for children on how far every child still matters. If you're long enough in the tooth, like me, you'll remember this title for a green paper that was really draft legislation from September 2003. It was called Every Child Matters. Let's confirm here that the need to say that phrase out loud at that point arose from a nation's knowing that actually not every child mattered and that some hadn't for a very long time. I continue to argue that we've some way to go before they all do, and that we are deeply uncomfortable with what we might have to do to level the playing field for those who are the neediest and the furthest behind. Perhaps that acknowledgement answers the question, do they all matter? 
it should certainly be a call for action to ensure they do, even at a cost to our own comfort. That green paper and the 2004 Children Act that followed it arose from yet another in a long litany of our failures and our tragedies, visited on the lives of some children in the sixth richest nation on earth. In spite of our welfare state and all that should have followed from our having it. In this instance, as a nation, we were reeling from and the media, politicians, the nation at large were reacting to the absolute horror of the death of Victoria Climbier. At the hands of people she knew, extended family members in whose care she was living, in the full sight of every agency concerned and across the public sector. The nation, digesting with difficulty the awfulness of this chilling case, also knew it wasn't the first time. We had a litany already of children's names reaching back decades, even after the formation of the welfare state. Long before its inception, we had what we now visit as, as London's Foundling Museum, which was once the Foundling Hospital, and places like that were scattered across the land. We know Victoria's name would not, and believe me, it will not be the last. Indeed, names have already been added to the list of dead and damaged children, known but somehow not seen, invisible and therefore not safe. After her story came to life, light, sorry, the government asked Lord Laming to run his first inquiry, which focused on this case. He would be back in the same London borough to run another after the equally disturbing and truly horrific death of toddler Peter Connolly. In the report of his inquiry after Victoria's death and its attached narratives, he made very clear recommendations about social care, but also about health, policing and education. He urged them all to come together on prevention, protection and solid lasting provision to change outcomes for the better, especially where children are vulnerable. Do the simple things well, was his mantra. That and a clear call that we all place the child first and foremost in our concerns. And as professionals, we stand by a level of cool scepticism on the child's behalf, if necessary in the teeth of parental or carer resistance, mendacity, or as in Peter's case, superficial compliance. We have to pause and ask how wise it is to go on from such pronouncements to legislate in the face of truly visceral reactions to tragedy. I'd ask you to note that we do this a lot in this country in all sorts of moments. The Winterbourne View scandal, for example, in the adult learning disability world, which has led to needed change. But it's come via legislation, is my point, rather than a practice-driven insistence on and true co-ownership of the need for that change. Policymakers are so often besieged by the cries of do something or be forever judged wanting. Blame somebody and see to it by legislating that their equivalents never do it in future. Blame somebody. Never let it happen again. Few of these issues can actually be addressed by simply passing a law. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. You can legislate for what you want to happen. You cannot legislate for what people will do or how they will interpret that statutory insistence. Otherwise, there'd never be any drink driving or carriage of illegal and illicit drugs or theft or burglary. There are laws against all of those things. How we follow them or not is what actually matters. People's actions will ensure that they abide either wholly or in part or ignore or subvert or break the law. You can't police that entire range. But I do firmly believe that the 04 Children Act that followed the 2003 Green Paper, although it was born out of the muck and the sweat of rapid shocked reactions, is a signal piece of legislation, embodying what we as a nation should surely want for all our children. The expectation in that act that a single post holder, the Director of Children's Services, and one politician in each local authority, the lead member, would stand up for every act aspect of childhood, that all services for children and young people from universal through targeted to highly specialist would work as one, answering to those two people who would themselves be held to account. 
that public agencies, including schools spending public money, would have a statutory duty to cooperate with each other. That their workers would seek first, not last, to work together, to share information, to share risk and responsibility, to unite around the child and the family, not their professional preoccupations or jealousies. That they would seek actively to prevent rather than react to harm and crisis in a child's life. All of these aims are truly laudable. Where they work, still, they're doing great things. Eleven years on from its passage into law, the best, the most creative, the wisest work I see in localities right now is the living out an embodiment of that law and its guidance and of the centrality of the child's rather than the professional's concerns. It has never been repealed. It remains on the statute books, although we rarely talk about it. Rarely mentioned in political discussions, it was very hard won and it continues to be both important and binding. That law created the post I held as the second incumbent in post from 2010 to 15 as Children's Commissioner for England. In 04, in that act, the role was simply to represent the views and interests of children and young people. It was amended by an equally signal piece of legislation last year's, no, the year before's, 2014's Children and Families Act. Therefore, its primary function now is to promote and protect the rights of the child. Those rights are already enshrined in large parts of UK law and they're stated in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child whose 25th birthday was the same year, 2014. We are a signed and ratified state party and the Convention underlies what's done by the Children's Commissioner and although it's not binding in UK law, it's an international treaty and therefore it has weight and bearing on the work of any children's service. More about the Convention in a while. Under the first post holder as Commissioner, Sir Al Ainsley Green, the Commissioner's work influenced real change to the detention of children, either for mental health or immigration um, administration purposes. And that was work that started before I arrived in post. The baton I took up meant I started from day one to state the fundamental importance of the rights of the child in English society. It was my job to press for acknowledgement of their status as citizens not as recipients of what adults choose to give them. It was my job to challenge policymakers, the media, society, practitioners, to promote and protect those rights and to prove we do so. My successor, Anne Longfield, took up the post on the 1st of March last year as I stepped down just about a year ago. Exactly as I did in my first year, Anne has so far worked on and published the work I started and planned and put down and funded and her year two starts soon, and it will then be entirely hers. She'll serve till 2021, and when she hands over, her successor will in turn deliver a first year's programme that Anne will have planned. And that's exactly how it works in schools. And that's exactly how it works in social care offices, and in hospitals, and in health teams, and in youth offending services. The work rolls on, and you pick up that work as the post holder who has next stepped into that space. As in so many jobs, from headship to medicine, it's never about the person holding the position, it's about the work. It's about the child. Within a law that describes your job, quite possibly, governed as I was by a statutory framework, public servant spending public funds, accountable to parliament, doing the work in the full glare of publicity and media and social and political uh, scrutiny. If you work in this field, we take for granted, surely, that the rights of children and young people are a given. It's an equal given that adults' role, backed by the 04 and 14 Acts in this case, is to bestow, ensure, promote and protect them. There isn't anything for any policymaker, for the public body, for the head teacher or school, for the community or council, to fear from children being acknowledged and treated as if they hold those rights. They're a given, they're solid, they're concrete, they're described, they're exemplified in the Convention and its associated documents. They're granted by us as adults. It's automatically pres presumed that that's the case when you work in this field. The notion that safeguarding children, that educating them, that nurturing and parenting them, keeping them well or making them better if they're sick, welcoming them to discussions about decisions, are all based on an acceptance that they are people. They're not waiting to be people. Their involvement are the basis of the 04 Act 
and of the 1989 Act and of the 2014 Children and Families Act. They're not sitting in a limbo waiting for some adult to go abracadabra, you're a person, when they're 18. To be admitted somehow to some club that says now you can have these rights. We in society and those in policy-making roles have to develop an ability to hold the notion that they and we all are rights holders in our society. They are, after all, experts in being who they are. Children. You were a child once. I bet you told people you were an expert in your life. They all are, and so were we when we were children. They can and they do advise adults, not as mini-dictators, not as people running amok, but as informed co-constructors of how their lives should be. And my argument, the more vulnerable they are, the more that's the case. And in the 14 Acts work on SEN and disabilities, you will see if you read it and the statutory guidance that goes with it and the new SEN code of practice, that the voice of the child, the family, the parent, the siblings, the relatives, the carers is shot through that guidance. It's absolutely at its core and centre. Having done that amazing job for five years, this, as I see it, obvious concept remains actually deeply mistrusted by quite a lot of adults. Children's rights are politically contested in many nations, including here. Too often they're summarised in adult concepts and language, and the reality is lived out in adult territory and on adult terms. The notion that if you're under 18 you have rights that are undeniable and indivisible and unviolable, reliant not on contingency, not on adult permission, but just there, is really uncomfortable for some commentators. On the one hand, we worry about and protect our children from the slightest threat or ill. And I think this, this set of conundrums I'm about to explore is at the heart of why we find it difficult to pin the rights agenda where it needs to be. Often, we do not let our children travel alone. If you work with children with special educational needs, you will know that the parental opinion that they will die if you make them get on a bus is absolutely at the heart of the argument between the local authority, the school and the family. They will actually not survive if you treat them as if they were trainable to be independent users of public transport with a buddy. So they have to have a taxi that takes two hours to get them to school and two hours to get them home because that's, that's it. Here's another example. Many children are not just not allowed to mix with society at large without an adult who guards their every move for fear of them meeting a threat, a danger, an abductor, a something if they dare go into the shopping centre, aged 14. They might get chucked out if they've got their hoods up, but that's a different issue. But think about it this way. At 12, they may independently have a pet of their own, whether you want the dog or not. <laughs> if that's news, I'm really sorry. <laughs> At 14, in English schools, they are asked to choose an increasingly limited choice, admittedly. They are asked to choose subjects that will either push them down an arts and humanities or a science route, quite possibly, for life. At 14. At 16, with your permission, they may join the forces. They will not be deployed to fight, but they may join. They may marry they may leave home. At 17, they may drive any size of vehicle as long as it's on their licence that lets them. They must stay on in education, however, and they're not permitted to vote for any of the things that rule any of what I've just listed until they're 18. At which age they may leave home, get a loan, rent their own property, get a loan at any interest rate, actually. Uh, if they're 18 and they join the forces at 16, they could be deployed on front line at 18. If they're disabled, if they have a mental health condition or a life-limiting illness, they, the day they turn 18, for service provision purposes, but not in the 2014 Act, they are deemed adult and they are moved into adult services. Whether or not they're ready, whether or not those services have anything like the same mentality, philosophy or way of working as children's services or schools, they are deemed adult. If they've been in residential care or they're fostered with somebody who doesn't do staying put on their 18th birthday, they will leave care and they will go independent and they may or may not be supported depending on how good their local authority is at doing it. 
If they've been a young offender, that's the point where they go into an 18 to 25 young offender institute, which is basically a prison for slightly younger adults, not a young offenders institute. If they've been in secure mental health provision, I used to have the right of entry into those places, and they were sentenced there rather than just sectioned, and their sentence has still got years to run, they will go into adult secure hospitals at 18. Trust me, an adult secure hospital is nothing like an adolescent forensic mental health setting. If you're just wondering how the 18 year olds you know would cope, good. Because we need a national debate about 18 to 25s and how well or otherwise society deals with them and whether or not they get into employment as they should and so on. We still live in a country where too many adults are only really comfortable when children, especially somebody else's children, are quiet recipients of what we consider they deem worthy, we deem them worthy to receive. We filter what they're entitled to. We make those entitlements contingent on their behaving well and being deemed worthy, rather than holding them automatically because we promised them in their society in human rights legislation. In some invisible classroom governed by some equally invisible star chart, they have to earn their human rights and prove they deserve them before they're granted. In our collective adult psyche, there persists a notion that children having them, learning about them, practically enjoying them, somehow reduces our rights, creates an uncontrollable liberty hall and a breakdown of, down of societal norms as every under 18 year old in the nation runs amok. That actually what they become is informed, critical, thinking, co-constructing, citizens through their schooling and elsewhere is an inconvenient truth. It's a negative that is brought into the debate, given that actually when you meet them, if they've learned about those rights, they are actually really strong contributors to their future democracy and the society into which they will become adults. The narratives that we foster create unnecessary intergenerational tensions. I should be frightened of the teenagers uh, and the teenagers should be frightened of the old people and actually in, in no shared space do we come together truly to create a society that is intergenerational. That's really sad. And that sadness escapes children themselves and somehow it passes by the people who will create a scaremongering view, particularly of other people's children, although obviously not of their own. We're not universally child unfriendly as a nation. I really have an issue with how well we deal with our adolescents. And that is very sad indeed, because very often they're angels till they're 11. And then in the summer holiday between primary and secondary school, they go through a cocoon experience and come out the other end as something off aliens. I don't know why that psyche is so persistent, but somehow we have to break it. That UN convention that I mentioned earlier is actually the world's most signed human rights treaty. One nation hasn't signed it, and that's the United States of America. But when you look at the potential for the person that they might choose to be president, you do start to wonder. Anyway, <laughs> um, it will come in the US. It will come. Perhaps the treaty's origins explain its absolute tenacity, that every nation on earth has signed it, more than have signed treaties about war and water and peace and arms and all the rest of it. It came from years of post-World War II discussion, debate and deep abiding concern about the plight of millions of children who were displaced by that conflict, who were left to wander in a mixture of conditions across a war-ravaged Western and Middle Europe. There have been statements about children's universal rights since the 1930s. The UN's first attempt itself as an organisation was in 1959, but it took 30 more years of argument to get to the convention in 1989, and we signed it in 1991. It's very general in nature, and it presents no threat, therefore, because it's so general. It sets out the hopes and dreams of the UN's member nations. It stands alongside other conventions that seek to help the vulnerable and the powerless, the disabled, the trafficked, the enslaved, the poor, the wretched. Given that all but one nation on earth has, has signed and ratified it, it's a wonder that so few have actually incorporated it into the way they make national legislation. 
Some have, and what that means is that if you pass a law or if you state that a law shall be passed that has a direct effect on children, young people and families, the convention has to be applied as one of the critical lenses through which you, you view that law in its passage. The Welsh have done it. Um, the Welsh have got a very limited devolution settlement and therefore, whilst they can look at a variety of things, they can't, for example, look at things like welfare or defence or tax because it's not devolved. But that they've got one is a signal example to the rest of us in the UK. The governments of all complexions across the world that stating controversially that what they do complies with the convention, for me, simply proves that the words we comply are very easy to say. We're about to be judged by the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child as a UK state party, and the government had to put in a report. And the report went in, in the midst, in the teeth, in the face of the austerity, child poverty, benefit cuts, housing benefit issues, it went in in um, late 2014, early, early 15. And what it says is, we comply. Given that there are articles in the convention that talk about poverty, that talk about support, that talk about parents needing help and aid when things are tough, I'm not quite sure how the government could say we comply, but they did. And the UN will tell them that they don't. If you want my honest <laughs> assessment of things. The convention tries to set childhood in, in context. It tries to talk about the broad entitlements that all children should have, that their interests should be at the heart of what you do. Not your interests, not the teacher's interests, not the social worker's interests, not the doctor's interests, or the police officer's, the child's. That holds true if you happen to be on the soil of the state party, not if you were born there. So all of the issues about the movement of peoples that we're living with now, as we lived with them after the Second World War, are directly affected by how we interpret the Convention. The rights apply to every child and young person. Because the, in English law, childhood extends to 25 for some categories of children and young people. If you've been in care, if you have a disability, that policy making covers you all the way to 25. The Convention's general principles are really important. They encapsulate inalienable entitlements to be seen as children and people in their own right, supported to grow to their full potential, having their voices heard and taken seriously, if necessary, being parented by the state, having their best interests at the heart of everything adult society does. And usually, actually, their own and our, our interests coincide. This is not scary territory. The Convention covers every aspect of childhood and it is accompanied by general, art, general comments that exemplify it and remind us that childhood is lived within society. It's not a separate adjunct or bolt-on. They do not live free of context created by politics, economy, technology and its place in their lives. They are just as interested as adults in what's happening in where they live, in their economy, in their environment. From being very young, if they're schooled to believe that they can have these discussions, they are interested in who governs their nation, who governs their locality, who sets the balance of their lives in terms of their family's income, taxation, benefits, their family's poverty or other social circumstances. They are interested, ask any 11 year old, in how to access physical and mental health services, treatment that they need, training, transport, leisure or cultural activities, and these are all encapsulated in the Convention. For the most part, let's just note, most of our children live peaceable, protected, balanced, nurtured lives that echo all of the Convention's aspirations for them. They live in really supportive families, in well-rounded communities that value what they do. They attend good or better schools. They take part in a range of activities that raise them to ensure they're balanced, productive young citizens. They take part in activities that pay their communities back for the investments made in their lives. We need to get better than we are at helping them to blow their own trumpets, at celebrating their potential and existing greatness. That's one way, surely, of reiterating that they do matter. Half a million of them take part in the Duke of Edinburgh Award every year. Nearly the same number are scouts or guides or cadets. 
Does anybody ever write that down on banners along the sides of castles and, and shopping centres? Do we ever see it on the tickers on BBC News 24? If there's only 12 million of them in the country and half of that number are under 11, then actually half a million 11 to 18 year olds doing all sorts of amazing volunteering and community and skill building is a remarkable achievement in this nation and we should be celebrating it. Our roles are very clear, but they're easy to state and harder to ensure because what the convention makes us is the bestowers, the ensurers, the enforcers of the rights of the child. We are actively and consciously and by choice, the promoters and protectors of those rights. We signed it and ratified it in 1991. I'm sure we meant it or was it just somebody stuffed a pen in somebody's hand and they said sign here. A great deal of our law, a great deal of the practice that follows it in teaching, in social work, in health and in other fields mirrors what's in the Convention. Since 2010, the government's promised on several occasions, including from the dispatch box, to view the making of all policy through the Convention's lens. In saying that, they encapsulate a deceptively simple notion that children have rights and they matter. They lay themselves open to accepting that the very hard reality is that for some children, in some circumstances, the rights are infringed and they don't. The Convention speaks about poverty and housing and health and justice and police and civic society and schooling and disability and parenting in exactly the same sorts of tones as any politician on the hustings. It's just that we don't marry the two together somehow and therefore we will have by 2020 between 400,000 and half a million children on our soil living in poverty. And nobody apparently is going to change that. I'd argue implicitly, whether explicitly or otherwise, the Convention and its tenets lie at the very heart of every law we've ever passed about children, including the 89 and 04 Children Acts and the 2014 Children and Families Act. It matters in terms of natural human and social justice, this issue, which is why I'm banging on about it. Children are vulnerable because they're children. Therefore, in power relationships with adults, they are always in second or lower places. Adults are the people who have the power to decide how they fare. They can't vote, for good or ill, for the policies that affect their lives. They're granted, or by circumstances of birth or what happens after it, they are denied agency and choice. They can't, and therefore we have to, level that playing field. How they fare is a crucial mark of how society at large fares. We are supposedly a socially just Western democracy. It matters that we stand four square for the rights of our most vulnerable and defenceless citizens and that they're taken into account. But the reality is that some children and young people live with are far more complex than simply stating what should happen and then sitting back to see if it will. Unintended consequences abound and they follow any policy making endeavour. But I argued when I was commissioner and I argue still as a consultant that their rights must be made more prominent and considered far more ro routinely and robustly when decisions are made. In the work I do now, it's centred on helping children's services teams in local government, health and other partner bodies to square some very tricky circles. I meet people all over the country who are absolutely passionate about their place and its people, including its children and young people. My analysis is that in too many places, there's a difficult combination of factors at work and some mean it's a real stretch to hold on to and fulfill the notion that every child still matters. The first factor, in almost any other setting than until very recently in a London, and there this issue is now coming into focus, people's budgets have been squeezed until the, the pips are squeaking. In some places, that was already a factor of local government settlements and the income of the place many years before the cuts that started in 2010. Where a long-term squeeze applies, made worse by those cuts since then, the ability to find innovation money, to dare to fund new things whilst the old ones are still a pull on the money, are factors that create immense difficulties for managers and leaders trying to do the day job and major change. If you add to the losses in local government, the losses in policing, the health service and other agencies, 
you have the possibility that to deliver their statutory roles, some people will leave the Every Child Matters partnership table because they can't afford to stay. The joint endeavours demanded by the 04 Act are never reveal, re repealed, are not cheap to fund. The second factor, there is a nervousness abroad and there's a, masking, a matching risk aversion that's grown across the continued reports of childhood tragedy. Names like Keanu Williams, Daniel Pelker, Poppy Worthington and many more. Those stories create a sense, somehow an agreed orthodoxy, that only a social worker will suffice if there is a need, only a statutory process will fix what's broken, and when you're inspected as a local authority, that's the basis of how you're judged. The stories create and fuel a climate in which referrals to these services rise to levels neither seen nor expected before, and where, when surveys are undertaken among agencies other than social care, they believe, and they'll openly state, that the only way to get even the earliest possible help for a family or a child who don't need specialist care or intervention is via a social worker. So you do get heads who go, send me a social worker, and when you go, you don't need one, they go, no, send me a social worker. And you do get social workers who are absolutely falling over as a result. They believe somehow out there the last survey my company did, 100% of the police officers who responded said the only way to get the earliest possible help, not highly specialised, early, was by getting a social worker on it. If you've got 100% of your community policing who are saying only a social worker will do, the system will creak, if, even if it doesn't fall over. That they can't possibly respond creates heat in the system because then people end up waiting rather than necessarily responding themselves earlier than social care ever could have done and possibly with better and more immediate effect. The third issue, and this is where my current work takes me right into the heart of localities, is that as part of trying to ensure earlier intervention works, just as Professor Mose, uh, Monroe's social work review and other commentators have envisaged, an awful lot of authorities now run front door multi-agency early help services and in some places, they are a long way down the track, working hard to operate on an interagency basis. In some, it's already going well. Children are kept out of upper tier, scarce, expensive specialist places and services. Their needs, and their needs are met in their families, in their schools, in their homes and communities. Savings follow, and as well as improvements in both shared practice and solid partnerships, those savings can then be recycled. But in an awful lot of places who kind of can't see the wood for the trees, there's too little or there's actually no understanding of why the demand is happening in the first place, why the front door is being pushed open all of a sudden by a, a, an influx of people, what's driving that demand, how it should be being met, how it's not being met, whether anybody's overwhelmed and if they are what they're overwhelmed by, because somehow they are not able either to divert or meet that earlier need. The dominance of the social care brand created by everybody up the escalator straight to the top has got to be a social worker. And by Ofsted, I have to say, although Sir Michael doesn't like it when I do. That, bra that paramountcy of the brand of social work in other agencies' minds, when actually that child or family should have been seen and dealt with earlier, and statutory specialist services shouldn't have been needed, means that risk ends up being carried at the top, hot end of the spectrum by people in the very specialist services that are being overwhelmed by the fact that somehow what should have been happening down here is either not being funded anymore or can't be supported or is itself not aware of what's going on or there aren't clear pathways. Meanwhile, social care caseloads grow, the systems creak, staff burn out, services elsewhere in the system become defensive practitioners who refer, if in doubt, but don't necessarily step in, to a space they should be occupying to slow down that escalator. The co-ownership isn't there, the issue is not shared, they don't share information or attendant risk. They refer. My work now is about helping people to kind of stop that giddy journey. <laughs> to sit back and say, just let's work out why 
we are where we are. What's happening? What is the community saying, doing, acting like? Have we got a growth in poverty? What's happening in terms of schooling? What's happening in terms of incomers, outflow, people who can't pay their rent anymore and are moving on and so on? We sit with them to help to get them to take a critical co-owned look at why what is happening is happening. And then we support them to step into the spaces where they and their partners can start to stop the rush to stop the demand from escalating. It's very hard work, but it's immensely satisfying. And we don't do it to people, we do it with them, which is the reason why I joined the company. Both in my last job as commissioner, in the one before it is DCS, in what I do now, my challenge to everybody, and I do this with clients, is that we have to act to hear the voice and to be the champion of the child. It's our business to raise other people's consciousness and conscience to remember the reality of their lives and to promote and protect their entitlements. We have to do it calmly. We have to do it without fear or favour. We have to do it openly and transparency where we are sure of our ground or we can become so and where we will be backed by evidence and the er unerringly honest voice of that child. It is vital, ladies and gentlemen, that together we go beyond very easy words that we use to say that we're bothered and that children matter and that we take our duties seriously under the UN Convention or any other instrument. Making every child matter was always, and it remains, about this nation's willingness to be bolder, to state that accepting and promoting and protecting their rights and entitlements means sometimes a different policy will be necessary and different practice than what went before. We owe them, we owe them that, all of them, rich or poor, whether they're like us or otherwise, whether they're easy or hard to live with, whether they, whether they teach us, whether we learn with them, who we nurture, how we neighbour. It has to include the children who are deeply challenged and equally deeply challenging to the society in which we live because that's the society that made the promises to our children in the first place, that every child should matter. They are not fresh out of a box like Lego people. You know, <laughs> they are incredibly different from each other and the better we can equip trainee teachers, early years workers, social workers, trainee ch school nurses, health visitors with the notion that n there is no such thing as the child, there is no such thing as the standard in just the same way as there's no such thing as the standard any of us. You know, I mean, and, and that you start from where that person is rather than necessarily where you think they ought to be or where your training tells you they ought to be, then you're, you're in more dangerous territory because what you're doing is sharing agency. And that's pretty tricky for a busy professional with a huge caseload or with masses and masses to do enabling a client or a, a student or a pupil or a, 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 a case to share that agency so that together you can find a way through is very scary. Um, and I think that's what an awful lot of parents with youngsters who have any sort of disability or special need actually face. I would say, because I'm a children's specialist, that um, specialist schools and SENCOs and others in the schooling system do it somewhat better than adult services do. And I just wish there was some reaching across gaps to do some co-learning between children's and adult services. The 04 Act did one huge disservice in that it stopped the life course thinking that had been very strongly present in a lot of local authorities. And we therefore have some way to go to mend that and to try and make a, a bridge for youngsters who hit late adolescence and go on into adulthood. And a, are carrying a lifelong difficulty and a lifelong set of challenges. And I, I don't think we do that very well. I really don't. I think 18 to 25 is a massive challenge for this, for this nation. I, I think I would also say that one of the things that we see in adult services departments in particular is that the, is that the rhetoric of the frail elderly is, is pulling services up the age range and that sometimes that that young adult population who are also clients is, is really struggles to find a place in the light 
But I mean, care, le care leavers are another of, of that population, aren't they? The, the child who suddenly hits the point where an independent life has to be lived. I'm, I'm still in contact with somebody who used to be on my young people's board, um, who's just coming up to leaving care. And very, very luckily, he's been with foster parents who they don't want to do staying put, but they've, they taught him from being very young some of the skills he will need in his life outside. So he can cook and he can iron and he can clean and he can budget and he can. But I, I used to meet care leavers who, especially if they'd been in some sorts of residential care, who'd never got beyond the door of the locked kitchen, who'd never boiled a kettle, who'd never cooked a full meal, who'd never been shown how to clean a toilet, who'd never... And, and those are the things that you, you set them up for failure, don't you, when, when they leave without those skills especially if they're particularly vulnerable and they've been in care for reasons of uh, severe maltreatment, neglect, abuse in their early lives. You need to make them stronger adults rather than dependent adults as they leave care. It's, it's so, and it's really, really difficult to do, really difficult to do. And I, th I think that's a really important thing to raise, but what I, what I, would, what I would say back to you is that um, you know, I mean, maybe I just came from a slave driving household, but I was taught all those things, um, I'm pleased to say. But if, if something went wrong, the person to whom I picked up the phone, or if I had to feed 12 people and I'd only got enough food for eight, I used to ring my dad. <laughs> dad, how do I make jelly con carne go further? But that's because I had a dad. And you come from a supportive family background, and I hear what you're saying, that actually you've had all sorts of skills gaps and knowledge gaps to fill as you've walked into a university existence. But if you come from a supportive family background, if you fell backwards, somebody would catch you. And in, in care leavers, that's very often not the case. And that's, that's where the difference begins to, to open for those people. What are we preparing our children for? Um, whose role of cotton wool are we actually wrapping around them and who's going to start to unpeel it? And, and how, f how much is that going to hurt? <laughs> and if you take away the cotton wool, wh where is the at least semi-soft landing for that person? Yeah. Society almost expects you to be everything and all things. And yet, you shouldn't be being expected to be everything and all things as a teacher, you're a teacher. But you also have a pastoral care remit. And sometimes that pastoral care for, for children with children and young people with, with p different sorts of disabilities and needs, that pastoral care is actually about the parents as well as, as well as the child. No, 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 he will be all right. If his friend brings him to sixth form, <laughs> it'll all be okay. We'll train the both of them. <laughs> you know, that sense of it's all right, you can step back. You can just let them become the adults that they need to be. Um, my my mum's sister had Down syndrome. And my grandparents uh, treated her like a child um, until she was well into her 40s. And it, pa it paid her no dividends, I'm afraid. They were of that generation and it was of that time, but th it paid her no dividends. And of course, they were elderly parents and they died and left her. And, you know, the family did all it could and she lived in group supported accommodation and with house parents and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, that, that sense of how far is the child with a need or a disability to be expected of rather than talked and brought down to. It's a really, really difficult one. And it's the same in a classroom where you've got a TA with a child with SEN. You know, are they, are they chunking up the learning to the stage where the child is learning its and bits and pieces and rather than a narrative or a, a stretch? And is a TA there to help you to do the stretching or is a TA there to try and keep the lid on the learning? And all of those things will, will challenge you. If you're already a practising teacher, you'll know that. And if you're training to be a teacher, it will, it will come to you. It's, it's a really, really difficult one. If I, if I give you a kind of two-parter, as, as commissioner, what my team and I did was very deliberately to go and work with the advocacy groups who were already working with those children and young people. So if I went into a young offenders institution, I was almost always with somebody from User Voice mm -hmm. who were setting up prisoner councils and offender councils 
Um, if I went into a mental health setting, I was almost always with somebody from Young Minds who were already working on an advocacy basis in that institution. And, and in particularly challenging circumstances, we talked very particularly to those interest groups of children and young people. In most local authorities, in most schools actually, there are representative councils or there are representative assemblies or there are representative forums. There are children in care councils in most localities. And I would, I would want to liaise with the adults who, who support and um, guide and help those uh, groups of children and young people, but to go in and talk with those groups of children and young people. And the Commissioner's remit is brilliant because you can say to the adults, the law says, go and have a cup of tea, I want to talk to these guys, see ya. <laughs> now, the work we do at the moment, we have, to we have to help the local authority to engineer those children and young people coming in to give us their views. But they are always incredibly enlightening and illum illuminating. And, and you know, those of you who've done this will know. They tell the absolute stock truth of what's happening in their lives. Even those with severe mental illnesses will tell you the absolute stock truth. And it adds a dimension to what you are thinking about as adults that you would not get in any other way. You know, when the child leans across the table to you and says, the asylum seeker child, I took some into the Lords just before I stood down and they absolutely floored them. We had a couple of Lords who were giving the government's line, why are you here? Why, you know, who says? And to, to see a 17 year old asylum seeker lean across the table and say, do you think I would have left the people I love and spent two years getting here if it hadn't been vital? <laughs> And people go, oh, <laughs> because, I mean, when you're asked a question that is of such searing truth, what, what else can you do but listen to their story? When you listen to a care leaver talking to parliamentarians and saying, you have to understand that every time you change my support worker, every time you change my social worker, every time you move me, a piece of my heart goes with that person and I can't get it back. Because they don't have our conventions, they don't live by our rule governed, only say this in this way. They just say it and it galvanises people to think differently. You know, that every time you change my support worker, a piece of my heart goes away and I can't get that back. How else are you supposed to respond except by trying to stabilise who you're working with and what they're doing? and to look at your workforce and to develop it and support it and make sure that it's there and it stays and those young people get what they need. They're capable of asking questions from a childish perspective that change the way adults think. And it's absolutely, it's amazing to watch it, you know? <laughs> and very often all you're doing is sitting and listening. I'm just getting smiles from my care leave friend over there, care leave support it, they are astounding when, when they're given the opportunity. If you've never watched the way that the British Youth Council, UK Youth Parliament take over the Commons on a day in November every year and listen to them speaking so passionately and you think, well, they're all from privileged backgrounds. Blah, blah, blah. Most of the ones I met were from perfectly ordinary backgrounds. They were just brilliantly trained to speak, to argue, to debate. They're not from amazingly privileged backgrounds. They're just kids. And we sometimes need to step off our professional high horse and get into this. Not, I'm not saying get down with the kids and go in in your jeans and your sweatshirt. I'm saying you'll always be an adult. But if you're an adult that's prepared to listen to them, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. And sometimes they'll tell you by kicking the windows in and upturning the furniture, and that's communication as well. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you have to meet them in little groups, and sometimes you have to meet them in, in far bigger ones. And the more vulnerable they are, for me, the small of the group, very important. And sometimes they'll tell you what is very uncomfortable for you to listen to and that will make you cry, you know. That's, yeah, serious, serious stuff. Childhood is not, you know, easy. For an awful lot of kids, it's not easy. We, we call them experts by experience. I don't know whether that's what you call them. Um, you know, I mean, in, in the consultancy world, that's, that's, what, that's what we would call them. So the work that we're doing in a variety of places with adult and children's services, th there's a strand 
of, of what you pick up in gathering the evidence to present back to your client that is about the expert by experience. What is the young carer telling you? And you will, and I, have, I defy you to work in a school where there are none. There are 700,000 young carers in the UK. The youngest young carer I ever met was five. And all she was doing was learning how the washing machine worked and making sure that it was stacked. Um, and that, you know, if it was all whites, it was all whites. And if it was colours, it was colours. And she, but she was helping her older sister to be a carer for a mum with MS and a disabled younger brother. It, it ma she, would go in, she was going to school having already done domestic tasks before she went into her year one class. What are they telling you in what they're not telling you? What are they telling you in the way they interact with each other, in the way they talk to their peers? It, it's, it is about being switched on and to have an expert by experience, an adult with autism, come into a space to work with teachers who've got autistic children in their classrooms. Priceless, absolutely priceless. And he, w he is his sort of autistic person. There is no such thing as an autistic, is there? It's just <laughs> I think, I mean, I just think universities like yours that are doing this sort of work, it is absolutely priceless. And to have somebody here from your resident local authority who comes to these sessions and the director couldn't come and somebody else has come in, that's really important, especially if there are schools in Baines into which you are placed if you're a trainee teacher. Very, very important that that dialogue is at work in the way that you're doing things. Mm -hmm.